Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 17, titled A Reading. A Reading is a story from my adult years. The collection of stories I have written and am reading to you cover many subcultures in our country that I have interacted with from childhood to my adult and senior years. A more extensive introduction to the Finding My Way stories takes place in the beginning of Podcast One. Regardless of which podcast you are listening to, you will find the story both entertaining and worthy of your reflective thoughts concerning its contents. The stories, as a collection, provide insights into a span of time that has played a role in shaping American culture and influencing its future. The stories provide you with a sense of admiration for the culture's collective courage and our country's commitment to justice and its optimistic willingness to address new challenges. A Reading Since childhood, I have been interested in psychic phenomena, which as a child I equated with magic. I knew magic was not real, but I could not help wishing it were. A spontaneous incident related to psychic phenomena took place in my infantry officer's officer candidate school celebration of our class's passage to senior candidate status. This was in the spring of 1967. As a review of events leading up to this occurrence will show, this incident seemed entirely out of context. Yet the memory of it has stayed with me over the years. That evening of celebration could have been a disaster. The training officer, Tack, of another platoon in the company had boxed in our platoon's lieutenant, our Tack. The other Tack's trainees had presented him with a pink rabbit for some reason. The rabbit's fur had been dyed pink. During the evening meal, the recipient of the pink rabbit had gone on and on about how his platoon valued him. They had surprised him with the miracle rabbit. What he was really pleased about was that his trainees had found a way to break the training program's rules without getting caught. They had smuggled a rabbit into the barracks, kept it hidden for some time, and then truly surprised the tactical officer at the time of the presentation. All of the company's tactical officers were seated at their usual places behind the dining hall table, eating dinner on the raised platform, making it easier to watch the OCS candidates eat. The 200 or so trainees were seated four to a table, eating on the square. We had to eat all of our meals on the square, and that was with no eyeballing. Eating on the square meant that while looking straight ahead, you raised your fork to eye level, then moved it in a straight line out until it was directly over your plate, then dropped your hand and fork straight down to the plate. While continuing to look straight ahead, you allowed your fork to obtain food. Once it had, you reversed the maneuver. In one smooth, straight line, you raised your fork straight up to eye level. Then, in a sharp 90-degree angle, you pulled the fork straight back and into your mouth. This process was repeated until you were full. You were caught eyeballing, or the tax determined that no more time would be wasted on eating. Getting caught eyeballing was very bad. Eyeballing was looking anywhere but straight ahead while you sat at your table eating. If you were caught eyeballing, you would be ordered from your seat 
and assigned various unpleasant tasks. These tasks included, but were not limited, to such things as doing 50 push-ups, running out of the dining hall around the barracks several times, or climbing into the large garbage dumpster and standing at attention while garbage was poured into it. After four months or so of eating on the square and learning to avoid being caught eyeballing, I found the process of eating not all that bad. To increase their ability at catching someone eyeballing, Tax would leave their dining table to walk among the candidates as they ate. In the middle of one of those walking tours, the owner of the pink rabbit began shouting out his love for the rabbit declaring that it was a natural pink, not a dyed pink, as some had speculated. He went on and on about how his men, his candidates, were the best at all kinds of things. I instinctively knew it was time for me to leave the dining hall during this boastful tirade. No good was going to come of it. As I was taking my tray to the collection point for the kitchen, the tack laid down a challenge to our lieutenant. He charged our platoon with not valuing our tack and lacking the balls to do anything out of the norm. Our tack rose to the challenge. Addressing me specifically, he ordered our platoon to present him with a chipmunk at the senior candidate's coming out party. The senior candidate's party was a celebration party for our reaching the senior candidate level of the six-month training program. From this point on, the har harassment of the OCS candidates was basically over. During the remaining month or so of training, we were treated as if we were decent human beings. Our lieutenant stated that he wanted a live chipmunk, not a stuffed one that had wood chips glued to its shoulders or some other stupid substitute for a live chipmunk. If we failed to give him a live chipmunk at that Friday night dance, our platoon would not get a weekend pass for Saturday or Sunday. My gut feelings about our tack were that he was a decent, considerate man. His decree was out of sync with that assessment. Hidden issues were at work between our lieutenant and the pink rabbit tack. This was serious. A lot of the guys were inviting their wives and sweethearts to the party, and they anticipated a weekend pass. These women lived all across the country. They would have gone to all of the expense and traveled to be here for the celebration, but would not be able to spend time with their loved ones Friday evening after the celebration or all day Saturday and into Sunday if we failed in this mission. For example, my wife was in Danville, Kentucky. It would have been a huge and financial and emotional blow to us if she had left her high school teaching position to come to Fort Benning to learn that Friday night we couldn't spend the weekend together. As it was, we had decided that she wouldn't come for the event. That was the last week of her school. She had to close out the school year, but then she was going to come to Columbus, Georgia and live with me until I graduated. We didn't know where we, they would send me. I was probably going directly to Vietnam as a combat platoon leader. That was what all of my colleagues and I expected. It was the way it was at that time. It wouldn't be easy living off post as a senior candidate, but it wouldn't be harder not being with my wife for the remainder of my time in the States. I still had to make the 6 a.m. muster and participate in all of the training activities of the day. The nighttime barracks chores would need to be completed in order for us to pass the morning inspections before 
I could be with her. The main plan to get the chipmunk revolved around one of our platoon mates' sweethearts. She worked on, in a large pet store in Atlanta. She would get one for us. If her store didn't have a chipmunk, she would call stores across the country and get it. This was an easy task to accomplish, we thought. We were wrong. About two weeks before the party, my platoon mate reported that his girlfriend could not find a chipmunk. She had called pet stores all across the country with no luck. She could get us a gerbil if that would do. I didn't know what a gerbil was. A gerbil looks just like a chipmunk, except it doesn't have the two light brown stripes running down its back, was the explanation I received. It is the same size, color, and shape as a chipmunk. Well, it would have to do if we couldn't find one or get someone to trap one in the wild. It was suggested that we just paint two stripes on its back. I was sure that wouldn't work. The hostile tack would point out the paint when we presented it to our tack and box our lieutenant into rejecting it. The burden was on me to solve this dilemma. I had to figure out a way the gerbil could be presented to our tack so that he would accept it as a real chipmunk. Just days before the party, it came to me. I would tell this outrageous story about the chipmunk that everyone would buy into. I could not reveal the story to anyone. I needed it to be a surprise when I told it to the lieutenant so that the audience's spontaneous reaction to the story would be so forcibly positive that our lieutenant would willingly accept the gerbil as a chipmunk. The crowd's positive support had to be so strong that the pink rabbit tax anticipated objections would be shallow and, within the military context, un-American. The strategy worked. Shortly after the party had started, our tech shouted out for his chipmunk. We all gathered around him and the other officers who were seated at a table near the band. Everyone knew that the stakes were high for our platoon. All 200-plus men and their dates crowded around the seated officers. As prearranged, I called for the chipmunk to be presented. A couple of our guys pushed through the crowd, holding up a stuffed monkey with wood chips glued to its shoulders. This brought an angry response from our lieutenant. He stated that he had told us not to give him this object. I agreed, pointing out that this stuffed monkey was just what unworthy candidates would present to their tack. The crowd muttered its agreement. I went on to say that we had a true hero of a chipmunk to present to him, one worthy of the honor of our lieutenant and his OCS candidates, a chipmunk with no other peer. As our guys brought forth the cage gerbil, I went on to tell a story about how, as a sergeant, with sergeant stripes proudly displayed on his back, he had routed a herd of elephants in Vietnam that were rushing needed supplies to the Viet Cong. The battle was won because of this chipmunk's single-minded bravery. As a reward for his heroism, he was allowed to give up his stripes and become an infantry officer right here at Fort Benning. The story brought a roar of laughter and applause. Our lieutenant happily declared the gerbil a chipmunk with a roar of approval from the crowd and the muted protest of the pink rabbit tack. We were all in a joyous state of celebration for the rest of the party. Our guys would be able to spend the weekend with their loved ones. Towards the very end of the party, one of the guys from another platoon introduced his date to me. We laughed about the chipmunk stunk. 
I really like this guy, as did so many of the uh, OCS candidates. He went on to tell me that his girlfriend was a psychic. That grabbed my attention. I told her how much I regretted not being able to talk to her about her experiences. I stated that I was very interested in the subject. My classmate said that he knew that I would be interested, which is why he wanted to introduce her to me. How did he know I was interested in psychic questions? I had never openly spoken about my interests. Throughout my childhood and into graduate school, I had always held an interest in psychic phenomena. It was just that you never spoke openly about psychic things. You would be ridiculed if you did. That's not to deny that once in a while, in hushed tones, you would talk to someone about psychic stuff. But just as a topic of mystery, not something that was so real that it happened to people you knew. So I had a real interest in psychic phenomena that I would not openly discuss with anyone. Somehow, some people knew about that interest, but seldom let me know that they knew. As an escape from the tensions of my first job after leaving the Army in June of 1969, I ran across a book about Edgar Casey, The Sleeping Prophet. It was the first time I had ever encountered some documented, unexplained psychic type of phenomena that I considered to be credible. Now, there were things in that material that were just beyond any level of credibility, like reincarnation and life after death. However, there were reports of documented psychic predictions from Edgar Casey that impressed me. Casey's trance-like readings on someone's health and the recommended treatments that were documented to have worked were convincing. The material strongly suggested that something beyond our understanding was real. I didn't pretend to know what real was. Whatever it was, it gave me hope. The hope was that there was something more than what we saw in front of us. A guiding force knew what was happening and directed us when we allowed ourselves to listen. Now, I understood that this was not the scientific view of the world, nor the mainstream view of the world. You couldn't just openly discuss these things. You would quickly be ostracized from any well-educated group of people. The risk of believing such things was being labeled a religious fanatic or worse. After two years of functioning as the only school psychology, psychologist, I should say, serving seven inner city schools being integrated for the first time in St. Petersburg, Florida, I got admitted to the University of Tennessee's psychology department's doctoral program in school psychology. Even though I had a master's degree in school psychology, I was told that it would take me five years or longer to complete the program. The length of time it would take me to graduate was dependent upon my passage through well-defined evaluation levels the doctoral program had established for all of its Ph.D. psychology students. There were five basic levels to get past. Each one would take an estimated year of preparation to accomplish. Somewhere along the line, at least one of those levels would take you more than a year. Leaving my Florida position with a wife and two toddlers to enter a five-year-plus doctoral program was stressful. My wife had a high school teaching job at the school near the house we had to buy in order for me to get in-state tuition. Thank heaven for the GI Bill and its funding supporting education. The psychology department didn't trust my master's level training in psychological testing. 
so I had to do extra things in that area, along with the 18 hours of coursework I was taking. It was a stressful time. Adding to my stress was the fact I had not passed the department's first hurdle. The entering class in the psychology doctoral program had to take a test on the mastery of current facts established in the nine domains of psychology. The test was created by the department's faculty. A passing score was not established until the test had been administered. The faculty would review the test results and determine the passing scores in such a manner that at least 40% of those taking it would fail. Those who fail would be allowed to retake the test in the spring. Those graduates who failed the test the second time would be dropped from the program. The word among the senior graduate students was that you could appeal to take the test a third time in the fall with the newly entered class of graduate students. Failing the th third test was it. You were gone. I was stressed. Here I was with a wife and two toddlers competing against these brilliant graduate students straight out of undergraduate school knowing all of the current areas in the nine areas of psychology. I had been out of graduate school for five years and didn't even know there were nine areas of psychology. I repeat, I was stressed. I could manage the coursework. My experience in the Army Special Warfare Center working on psychological issues for two years had prepared me extremely well for the graduate work. The Army provided me the opportunity to work with some highly regarded psychology professors. In turn, my work as a practicing master's level school psychologist for the last two years had made student evaluations comparatively easy for me when contrasted to the other graduate students. I had administered the standard psychoeducational test at least 300 times compared to the 10 or so times expected of the normal graduate school student. The coursework wasn't my problem. My fellow graduate students were at a disadvantage when compared to the hard intellectual work demanded of me by the Army. I knew that no one had worked harder or longer hours than I did on issues related to psychology during my two years at the Special Warfare Center. My problem was getting through the department's big testing events and doing the research for a dissertation. Test results never reflected my true knowledge of a subject. With the exception of the few times I got lucky on a test. Then I did extraordinarily well. I couldn't count on getting lucky in this graduate school. Well, there were two other pro problems. One was having enough time to do all of that, doing all that had to be done. The other problem was money. My wife worked all day in a highly demanding job. We had two toddlers to raise. I needed to study in the evenings. She needed to grade papers and develop lesson plans. Daycare, diaper services, and normal living issues consumed our income and a lot of time. I found that reading the Igor Casey material sent from the Casey Center in Virginia Beach, Virginia, helpful in reducing my stress level. It gave me hope of something bigger than the constant struggle to get ahead. There were just a very few close graduate students to whom I dared to mention a little of the Casey material. They were surprisingly receptive. Being rigorously trained in the scientific method, we naturally challenged every concept of reported explanations 
for verified events. One of the graduate students' wife told me about a psychic lady who lived near the part of town where my family and I lived. She thought the psychic was about to hit on things for her that the psychic had no way of knowing about beforehand. Her anticipation was well-founded, she stated. She gave me the woman's name and phone number. After thinking about it for several weeks, I mentioned the psychic to my wife. Our first summer in Knoxville was underway. It provided a break for my wife from teaching school. She was able to spend more time with the children. I continued taking courses at the university. I was trying to get through the program as rapidly as possible. I also needed extra time to study in preparation for getting through the second of the five hurdles in the fall. I had passed the first testing phase in the spring. It was the one I had failed last fall. It wasn't until the third or fourth year of graduate student that a senior graduate student attempted to pass the general's examination that I was targeting in the fall. It was two days of writing essay answers on very broad psychological issues that required you to cite specific research or literature on the topic and writing your answer to each question. Approximately 40% or more of those taking the test failed it. Those who failed it could appeal to take it the following year. Reportedly, it was rare for a graduate student to be allowed to try to pass generals a third time. My wife su suggested that I call the psychic, Vivian, and see how much she would charge and when she could see me. We could consider a reading from Vivian a birthday present, since my birthday was fast approaching. Vivian could see me two weeks from the day I called her. She would charge me $5 for a reading. We set the date. Her house was on Chapman Highway near John Sevier Highway. It was about three miles from our house. The day to get the reading had arrived. I felt like a fool. This was a waste of money. These fortune tellers were fakes. This was so unscientific. Why was I doing this to myself? On top of all those feelings, of self-doubt, I was afraid. What if she was accurate on some things? What would I do then? How would my worldview be forced to change? Why was I putting myself under this pressure? It was with mixed emotions that I drove to the address Vivian had given me over the phone. I am not sure what I expected to see, but what I saw was definitely not what I expected. This house was a poor excuse of a house. It was tiny. It was more of a run-down shack than a house. I knocked on the screen door. The screen was torn in one corner. Because of the heat of the day, the windows in the front door were open. I knocked again. A parrot in the house screeched from the left side of the screen door. A weak voice coming from the right side said, Come in, sweetie. The squeaky screen door opened and bumped on the floor as I walked into the dimly lit room. The elderly overweight woman was propped up in the bed pressed between the back wall and the opening for the door. Her hands were obviously crippled 
as she raised the glass to her dry lips. The glass was clasped between her thumb and forefinger, as her other fingers were pressed deeply into her palm in such a manner that it was apparent they had not moved from that position in years. Sit down, sweetie. Bring that chair over there. Here. Sit right here beside me now. She wheezed between little gasps for air. Vivian was an old woman with not long to live. She appeared to live in pain and poverty. Screech! Screamed the parrot. Shut up, you damn old bird! Screamed Vivian. Yes, I thought. I'd been had. Don't mind that old bird. Now you're the one who called for the reading, right? Yes, ma'am. Good. You're right on time. Now give me those playing cards. She mumbled, pointing to an old deck of regular playing cards sitting on the little end table beside her bed. As I handed her the card, she said with a pleasant smile, Now reach that bottle of Southern Comfort and pour a little into my glass, please. I did. She took a little sip of it and set the glass down. Now take the cards and shovel them nice and long for me. That's right. Do a good job. Pull that board over there. Put it on my lap. That's good. Now lay some of the cards down on it. She proceeded to lay the first few cards on the make-do table and studied them. Looking at me, she said, I see you're a graduate student in medicine about to become a doctor. Uh, no, ma'am, I'm in psychology. Well, that's a healing profession. That's what I meant. You're about to graduate, aren't you? Uh, no, ma'am, I just started. It will take at least four or five more years if I ever do graduate. No, you're wrong. This time next year you'll be through with school. You will have a job as a psychologist. It will be here in Tennessee. You will not have to move from the house you live in now. Honey, would you pour me a little more of that uh, Southern Comfort? She asked after finishing a long drag on a glass of the same. That's all for now. Don't pay me. You will be back. You will be back next year. You will be back after you start that new job, she stated, taking another sip of Southern Comfort. I tried to pay her, but she vigorously refused to accept the $5 bill. As I was leaving, a brand new Mercedes-Benz sedan pulled up in front of her house. It was driven by an extremely well-dressed older lady. As I got into my car, the woman got out of hers, made a friendly wave to me, and entered Vivian's house as she was greeted by the screams of the parrot. My wife and I laughed at the telling my visit with Vivian. She was an obvious total failure as a psychic, but what a wonderful character as a human being. You just couldn't help but like Vivian a whole lot. I did go back to see her a year and a half after that reading. Her prediction on, on the future were so far-fetched that I had just forgotten about her. It wasn't until the year and a half had passed that I paused to reflect on what Vivian had told me. I had finished the doctor program the following July. I had gotten through the department's fact check test, the two days of writing the general exams, my specialty project in psychology, in my dissertation, an analysis of various research project that tracked 26 factors across an experimental group of subjects, a control group of subjects, and a placebo group of subjects. I didn't receive the doctorate degree officially from the university until that December because my major professor had missed the filing date for receiving the degree in August by two days. I had a job that started on the first day of July as predicted by Vivian. 
I was to develop the first comprehensive school psycho psychological services for seven small school systems through an educational cooperative and to provide training to the area school system staffs on the implementation of the newly passed special education laws being enforced by the state for the first time. The cooperative's offices were less than 10 miles from my home. <laughs>